God bless all of you. It's so good to see so many young people here today. This is awesome. Awesome. And the sisters that are with us, these are Dominican, Dominican sisters. Welcome, sisters. Thank you. And to the priests and bishops that we have here today as well. As you know, it is an honor for me, and Ernest is right, I asked, I, I am so busy now as the provincial superior, um, I have been voted in to be the provincial superior of all of the United States and Argentina, and that is a huge job so I had to cancel about 85% of my scheduled events. And so I only am keeping a couple, a few, and this was one that I knew I wanted to keep, and I am planning on coming back again. I am like MacArthur, I shall return. <laughs> My, you all know my love for the Filipino people. My love for all of you and your culture and your country. You are an ally of the United States and we stand with you. That is very powerful. And you know, my love for the Filipino people is because they embraced me in New Jersey in a town called Newark, the very first talk I ever gave was to 12 Filipinas in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> and they said, you brother, at the time I was just a brother, and they're texting me, texting me, come speak to us. There was only 12. And, you know, I learned that you Filipinos are considered the most sociable people in the world. Did you know this? Yes! You are the most hospitable people in the world. I have never met a Filipino who was rude to me. Never. I've never met someone who was not nice. And so, but what I learned is you send more texts than all of America and Europe combined. <laughs> and since being here, I think you send 20 times more selfies than we do in America. At one dinner, we had 500 pictures. <laughs> I said, I can't do another picture. There's a picture of the salad, a picture of the Coca-Cola, a picture of the, the, the chicken. I said, we cannot have any more pictures. <laughs> but this is why I love your culture. The people are so friendly. And this is more importantly, why do I love the Philippines? More importantly, I love the Philippines because you, and you will hear me say this, not just in the Philippines. You will hear me say this in Ireland. You will hear me say this in South Africa. You will hear me say this in Argentina. You will hear me say this in the United States. There are two chosen people in the world today. Now, who was the first chosen people? The Jews, right? The Israelites. Because what does it mean to be a chosen people? It does not mean God likes you more than anybody else. He did not like the Israelites more than anybody else. To be chosen means you are given a mission. And the Jews were given the mission 
to teach the world there is only one God. You see, the world believed there were many gods, and there's only one. And the Jews lived up to that mission. Now, why then is he not using the Jews today? Well, unfortunately, they have rejected Christ. Now, he will bring them back. Their time will come. But what is God doing in the meantime? He is using two new groups of people. I am absolutely convinced, and God has shown me this. The two groups of people God has chosen. The first is Poland. Jesus told St. Faustina that a spark would come from Poland to prepare the world for his final coming. What is that spark? It is divine mercy. Saint Faustina, Pope John Paul II, and you know what I just heard? One of the largest gatherings in human history was in Manila. Was in Manila. When John Paul II came, I saw pictures. There were people hanging from the bridge. Swinging like monkeys <laughs> to be able to see John Paul. So that spark to come from Poland is John Paul II, Saint Faustina, Divine Mercy, and the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. This is our community, as Ernest said, that God gave the message and the devotion to spread around the world. But we, you know what he found out? And now, why did he pick Poland? He picked Poland because no nation in all of World War II suffered at the hands of Nazi Germany than Poland, yet no nation remained more Catholic in all of Europe than Poland. So he chose Poland from which divine mercy would come. Then he gave it to the Marian fathers for us to spread around the world. Do you know what God found out? You Marian fathers cannot do it. I'm going to have to give you an army of four foot tall Filipinas. <laughs> this is your new army. I believe the second group of chosen people are the Filipinos, are the Filipinos. I truly know this and truly believe this. This spark that came from Poland that Jesus said must be spread around the world. Poland, the spark came from Poland, but Poland was not spreading it. He gave it to the Marians, but we are too small to spread it alone. So he raised up another chosen people. And in World War II, we brought to you the American soldiers, the GIs, they call them. The Marines and the Army, they brought images of divine mercy and to the Philippines. Now, why are the Philippines the chosen people? Because no nation suffered 
at the hands of Japan in World War II, yet no nation remained more Catholic. God is rewarding you. He is saying you are a special people. And because he gives to who he loves the biggest jobs, the biggest tasks, because he loves you for staying with your faith, even though you suffered tremendously, you have a job. And my job is to teach you so you can go teach your brothers and children and co-workers and neighbors. And Jesus said to the Philippines, you are my chosen people. From the Philippines, I will spark, blow that spark all around the world. There is no nation I have seen with more people in other countries than the Filipinos. No matter what country I go to, there are Filipinos. I could go to the North Pole and there would be Filipinos. Always with their image of divine mercy. In fact, I have been to Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, North America, Australia. I've been to all the continents except Antarctica. And everywhere there were Filipinos. In fact, Father Dan Cambra, our former provincial superior, when he was giving the homily on Divine Mercy Sunday in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and he looked out at the crowd and he says, you know, I just got back from England. There were Filipinos praying the chaplet. He says, I was in the Middle East and there were Filipinos praying the chaplet. He says, they could do a lunar landing on the moon and there would be Filipinos <laughs> praying the chaplet. <laughs> So this is the beauty of what you have been given by God. And my love for that is immense. My respect for you as a people is immense. I have never met a Filipino that I did not respect because I know how much God loves you and how much he is using you. And so please, don't drop the ball. That's is an American idiom, meaning keep up the good work. And I want to tell you today a little of my own story of divine mercy. I don't tell this story often, but I felt compelled to teach you about divine mercy through a story. So Ron, if we could put the first slide up. On the first talk, okay, I want to tell you a story of mercy. Now, this is our National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where I am from and I, am, and I live. But before I became a priest, I was an engineer. Do we have any engineers here amongst the men or even the women? We have one here, we have a couple. I was an engineer, a lot of math, a lot of calculus, and I worked here. Let's go to our next slide, Ron. I worked here at American Axle and Manufacturing in Detroit, Michigan. I went on to get my Master's of Business degree, my MBA, at the University of Michigan, one of the top schools in the world. And so I became an engineer working hard on cars. You see your cars that you are driving in the parking lot? 
If you see an American car by the name of Chevrolet, I designed the rear axles and produced the rear axles. So I would be in charge of making those, designing the production systems to make the wheels and the axles of your cars. It was a very good job, a lot of money. Then I decided that I wanted to make more money. And I gave up my job and started my own business. I moved to a place called North Carolina. And this is my house. This is looking out my window. I lived on Lake Norman. This is a beautiful lake in Lake Norman in North Carolina. I had a business on the other side of the lake. This is my dog, Rocky. He was the best dog in the world. I used to drive to work with my boat. I did not have to drive to work. I would boat. And you see Rocky? He's riding with me to work. This was my life. This is my boat that we had next to the inlet and the harbor. So I had a beautiful home on the lake, a boat. This is me at my job. I laugh, look at the computer back then. <laughs> Any of you here remember monitors that look like that? The young students are like, what is that? <laughs> so this was my job. I was much thinner back then. Now I eat too much pancit. <laughs> and jolly bees. <laughs> I told Ernest, he had a nice dinner. I said, I want jolly bees. <laughs> so I had a champ, a champ. And so then Roldan comes in and brings me two of them. And then I have the tuna pie. Very good. The mango pie and spaghetti. I, I think I gained 10 pounds from Jolly Bees. <laughs> so as you can see, I was thinner then. This was my job. And I owned a business on the lake. Now this is Lake Norman. Now the picture is going out. Ah, okay. Now, I would like to say this was my house, but it was not. <laughs> I lived over on the other side, up here in the corner on the far side, and this house was all the famous race car drivers. All the famous race car drivers that lived on the same lake as I did. So you had Jeff Gordon, Kyle Petty, and this home was owned by Joe Gibbs, who owned a race team. So this was my neighbor. So we lived the American dream. This was everything that a man could ask for. Now, I was making a lot of money. Now, I don't make anything. I used to make 50,000 American dollars a month. Now I live on $50 a month. I have nothing but I have never been happier. Never, never. And so what happened 
to change my life. It all started here, one church. So one night, when I owned my business, I was working late. And I work seven days a week, 6 a.m. to midnight. And I actually do that now in my ministry. I do not sleep much at all, about three hours a night. I don't know if that is a blessing or a curse. But I only sleep three to four hours a night at the most. And so one night I was working late. And I was coming back from my office and to get to where I lived, I would always pass by this church. Now when I would pass by, I would not pay attention. I wasn't going to church. Now, every day I would go by this church Somewhere in my heart, God was speaking to me. He was speaking to me. But one night he had to do something more drastic. Because he kept inviting me and I would not come. Thank God for every one of you. You are answering God's call or you would not be here today. Every one of you has answered God's call or you would not be here. I was not answering God's call. So one night I am driving home. It was very cold, which is not common in North Carolina. North Carolina is more south. Not quite as far south as Florida, but halfway down. It was very cold. And as I'm driving, all of a sudden, my steering went out. It stopped working. And I'm driving and the wheel did not work. And as the car is coasting, it made a right-hand turn into this parking lot. Do you think God is trying to speak to me? <laughs> the car was out of power steering. So you could really hard turn the wheel and when the car swerved to the right, I went down the hill. I can, oh, okay. The cursor does not, at the brake, we'll have to get a brighter light. Um, over here, if you can see my cursor, is where the parking lot, the road went down to the parking lot. And as the car pulled in, I did not know what was happening. All I knew is my steering did not work. And then at the time where this church is now, you cannot see it, but over on this side is a set of buildings going this way that you cannot see in the picture. So the building comes out like this. And it was the building that I'm referring to here existed before this church and sorry and so what happened was I I was still a few miles from home and I said no I don't want to force my car home so I saw some lights in the building and it was late, it was like midnight. And I saw some lights in the building. And I decided to go to the door. So I went to the far right side and I knocked and I opened the door and it was locked. Then I went around to the middle 
knocked on the door and tried to open it and it was locked. It was so cold and it was so far in this whole big field that I didn't bother to go to the third door on the far left end. So I came back to my car and I said, you know, if I force this wheel, I can get this car home. So I took my keys and I put it in the ignition. And the next five seconds changed my life. And it is why I am here today. If these next five seconds didn't happen, I would not be here. I took that key, I put it in the ignition, and I went to start the car, just forcing, thinking I could force the wheel to get home. Instead, something would not let me turn that key. And something kept telling me to go to the last door. It was so cold, I said, I don't want to go up and walk across this whole field again. So I started to turn the key. It would not turn. I couldn't turn it. So I was the one that could not turn the key. And I decided to go back to that last door. And at that last door, I opened it and walked in on this. They were having perpetual adoration. I had grown up Catholic and had never done a holy hour in my life. And God set this up. I walked in right to this and I fell on my knees. I had never been to Eucharistic adoration. And I fell to my knees and the words that came out of my mouth automatically, I didn't even think, they just came and I said, my Lord and my God. And I, on my knees, I knew that this was the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is Jesus. We cannot disrespect or pay no attention to our Lord and Savior present with us. You know, Jesus said, I must ascend to the Father, and he did. But he also said, I will remain with you until the end of time. Now, how is Jesus going to go back to the Father and then say, I will remain with you until the end of time. The Eucharist. So I started at that moment to change my life. You know, I had another story that happened earlier in my life. And sometimes God gives us consolations, but then we drift away again. I was living in Michigan, and I had a girlfriend who lived a long way away. 
I was in my early 20s. I had not yet found my faith. Even though I was Catholic, I was just going through the motions. And my girlfriend came up and stayed with me for the weekend. And late on Sunday night, she left, and I fell asleep. It was the middle of winter. Nothing was in bloom. No grass, no flowers, no nothing. And all of a sudden, I woke up, shivering, shaking. And God had shown me I was on the wrong road. I was on the road not to him. I was on the road to the evil one. I was living a life of money, power in my career, and I wasn't being chased. I was not living purely. Do you know those three things are the gods of the world? Sex, money, and power. I couldn't get enough of any of them. This is what many Americans are trapped in. You might say in the Philippines, we don't have all that money. Actually, you have more of a blessing. You might say in the Philippines, we don't have all that power. We can't affect on the world stage. We don't have the power. You know, and actually, God has given you more of a blessing. And you might say in America, everything goes. Here in the Philippines, we don't even have divorce allowed. This is a blessing. You don't want what America has. Power, sex, and money, you think makes you happy. Trust me from somebody who was there. Happiness is an external emotion. I was happy when Ernest took me to Jolly Bees. Happiness is an external experience. But joy, joy is different. That's internal. Not even Jolly Bees could give me joy. Only God can give you joy. So you know the three gods of the world, sex, money, and power? Do you know why these religious sisters and me, I am a religious priest, different than a diocesan priest. You all know this, right? Your priests are either religious or diocesan. If they are part of the diocese and they are assigned a parish, they are called diocesan priests. Other priests like Jesuits, us Marian fathers, Franciscans, or Dominican sisters, they are religious and they take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Do you know why? Because poverty is the vow that overcomes the God of the world of money. They take the vow of chastity. Why? Because the vow of chastity overcomes the God of the world of sex. And they take the vow of obedience. Because that overcomes the God of the world of power. 
Now it's funny because when I came to the Marians, they asked me if I was going to have trouble with any of the vows. They were most worried that maybe poverty because I had a home and a business. I said, nah. I sold everything and gave the money away. I'm more worried about chastity because I want to be married. Actually, they said that's a good sign for religious, the desire to be married. But now you have to focus that drive towards God. And they said, no, that will not be your struggle. Your struggle will be obedience. Doing God's will and the will of your superior and not your own will. You know what is funny? You know who was my superior when I came to the Marian Fathers? Father Don Calloway. You all probably know Father Don. And we used to have to scrub toilets. Now I am his superior. So I laugh. So Father Don, does that mean I make you now clean toilets? <laughs> no. He is busy spreading divine mercy. But it is funny because we have two kinds of priests, diocesan and religious. And when I told my family that I was going to become a priest with God's help, my mom was confused. And she said, a priest? I said, yes, but not, she goes, well, maybe you can come to St. Michael's. I said, no, mom, I can't go there. She's like, why not? I said, because I'm not going to be a diocesan priest. I'm going to be a religious priest. And my mom said, aren't all priests supposed to be religious? <laughs> she did not understand the difference. And so when I announced to my family that I was entering seminary, my mom cried for three days. My dad said, you are never going to make it as a priest. I guess he was wrong. <laughs> And my 82-year-old aunt said, you're going to be a priest? And I said, yes. And she said, I thought you liked girls. <laughs> I said, Aunt Helen, I was engaged to be married. Of course I like girls. But the most beautiful is Mary. Mary, she, she, and many women I have had in my heart, I have had many, many women in my heart. Now, they have all been pushed out. Yes, I am friends with many ladies, but this heart, is given to Our Lady. And if you do that, you can still be married to your spouse, but you can still give your heart to Our Lady. The second talk is going to be on Marian consecration and why you need that. No, I'm sorry. is going to be on spiritual warfare. And then the last talk will be on Marian consecration. You don't want to miss this. Do you know if you consecrate tomorrow, you will finish the 33 days when? Who knows? Who knows if you start the consecration tomorrow, when you will finish? I heard it, Mary's birthday. 
Mary's birthday. Ernest, do we have Slim Jims here? Okay, so you will have a chance to get the 33 days to morning glory that you can take with you. Please stay, because after this talk, we will talk about spiritual warfare, the devil, and then we are going to talk about Marian consecration. So, I want you to understand we have many things in the world that distract us from God. You don't have to be a priest to be focused on Jesus and Mary. Jesus and Mary are your two spiritual weapons. This is how we will show you to fight the evil one. The evil one. I had an amazing talk this morning with a woman whose daughter was overcome by Satan. And she took her life. A beautiful woman, young, had so much to give. I don't know how this mother was not devastated. She was, she is. But I do not know how she did not crumble Blaming God. Instead, this morning I looked in her eyes. And all I saw was hope and a belief that she has in God's divine mercy. And God is having mercy on her. Do you know what mercy is? What is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love. Now, of all the virtues, patience and temperance and fortitude and faith and hope, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest virtue, but is all love the same? Do I love Jollibees the same way I love my mom? <laughs> I better not. No. The highest form of love, the Greeks told us, is agape, where you would give your life. Love is willing the good of the other person. And the highest form of love, of all the different kinds of love, I love Father Don, he's my brother, but I wouldn't love him like I would a wife. That's a different kind of love. The world today, don't let this come to the Philippines, is trying to redefine marriage and teach you love is a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Feelings go up and down like this. Love is a commitment that even when my spouse drives me crazy, I will still love them. The highest form of love is mercy. Mercy is a particular mode of love, the highest form of love, that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. So, when is it divine mercy? So basically, mercy for you is when you see someone else suffering and you spend some time with them. You know that morning meeting I had this morning, I thought I was going to give this woman hope. I thought I was going to give her mercy. Uh-uh. She showed me mercy because of what she trusts in God. 
what she trusts in God. And divine mercy is when God sees our suffering and decides to do something about it. Now, when do we suffer? When we sin. And when did we first sin? In the Garden of Eden. And so after we sinned in the Garden of Eden, God could have crushed us. Instead, he had mercy on us. Mercy, instead of slamming us and condemning us, God gave us the gift of a mother and the promise of a savior. This is mercy. The gift of a mother, Mary, and the promise of a savior, Jesus. Now, Jesus is the only answer. Jesus told St. Faustina, divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. Divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. And he had mercy on this woman. She has hope. Faith. That's the definition of trust. A living faith. And Jesus said we can't receive mercy until we trust him. Do you trust him? Trust is accepting the help someone offers you. And God offered you Mary to help you. Don't reject that gift. Okay, so now what happened? I'm going to tell you a story. This is my grandma. You see that little guy in the middle? That was me at age four. And here I was planning the trip. This was in Utah, in the United States, where we had big dinosaurs. So we went to go see these dinosaurs. And that's my sister. This is my sister next to me. And that is my mom. Don't you love her hairdo? <laughs> this was very popular at the time I was little. And so this was my family. Well, one day, and I grew up with my grandma. We lived in the same town. And my dad would always take her to me to visit her. And all of a sudden, I realized that it was my busy life that was becoming more important to me. I got involved in high school. I was a wrestler. You can tell by looking at me, I'm not a basketball player. I was a wrestler. I got involved in school with my girlfriend, with my car. I was trying to get into the United States Air Force Academy, which I did. I was going to be a fighter pilot. That's all I wanted to do was be a fighter pilot, fly F-16 jets. But God had different plans for me, and I didn't know it. Then on Father's Day, 1993, I was home from school, and my family had a picnic. And my dad went to the picnic and I went, but my grandma didn't go. And this was before I became a Marian. And my grandma didn't go. So later my dad went to her house to check on her and asked me if I wanted to go. I said, no, nah, I'm too busy. A decision I will always regret. Because... What happened when my dad 
went to her house as he found her dead in a pool of blood. She had taken her life. Her life had become too much to bear. Her life had been full of suffering. She just couldn't take the pain anymore. Now, suicide is never the right answer. It is a permanent response to temporary problems. And so, <clears throat> I can't even imagine what my father went through finding his own mother. I can't even imagine. I think about that often, how my dad must have felt when he sensed, saw that. And my mom used a handgun, or uh, my grandma, used a handgun to take her life. She was suffering. I wish now I would have been more merciful to her. That I would have gone over to her house more to experience her suffering with her. To encounter her suffering and to do something about it spend time with her, help her, but I didn't do it. And so when my grandma died, I didn't even pray for her. I was more worried about our family reputation and what people thought of our family if the word got out. And so what happened was I didn't even pray for my grandma. And it, for 10 years, we never ever talked about my grandma. Why? Because we were a Catholic family and the Catholic church teaches that when you take your own life, you go to hell. No, that's not what the church teaches. But I didn't know that. So now, going back to this night, one of the reasons I stayed away from church was my grandma's suicide. For 10 years, my grandma took her life in 1993, and for 10 years we didn't talk about her, I didn't pray for her, I pretended she didn't exist, because I didn't want to think about her being in hell, so I ignored it. Now, this was exactly 10 years later in 2003. Exactly 10 years later. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and my heart is inflamed to come back to church, experience God's mercy. Mercy. And I kept thinking about God as justice. That because my grandma chose to take her life, she was never going to make it to heaven. I was a putting a limit on God. And so, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, I had this inspiration to go back to church. And so I started, I started to go to Mass, I started to go to Bible study. The priest was excellent and he started to walk me through the divine office. I started praying the prayer of the priests. And then he told me about something called a general confession. Because a general confession is where you sit down for confession, not when there's a bunch of people in line but on a special appointment. And you start from the very earliest time you can remember and you confess your sins as you go. 
Now, the very mem earliest memory I can have is when I was a little boy, my mom putting me up in the boat. And I had to confess that because when she went to take me out, I refused. <laughs> like, no, I was disobedient. And so I went through all of my life confessing my sins in this general confession. I got to grade school. That was not a problem. I got to middle school. Eh, then there was a few sins I needed to confess. Maybe not being nice to fellow students. Then I got to high school. I had more sins now that I had to confess. Because now you're getting older. And then I told the priest what happened 10 years earlier in 1993 with my grandma. And I said, I have to confess because I never prayed for her at her funeral. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I never prayed for her. I said, because, you know, I was too worried about our reputation. I was more worried about what people thought of our family because my grandma took her life. And I said, now I'm a knucklehead. I miss my chance to help her, to pray for her. Now she's in hell. And he looked at me and he said, huh? And I said, yes, Father, you know this. Anybody who commits suicide goes to hell. He said, that's not church teaching. Now it's a huge sin. You don't want to risk your salvation, and you might go to hell because of it. It's a very good chance you could go to hell because you took your life. But God's mercy is greater. I want you to go home tonight and pray the chaplet of divine mercy for the salvation of your grandmother's soul. I said, huh? He said, yes. Now, I didn't know what the chaplet of divine mercy was. And he said, go home tonight and pray the chaplet of divine mercy for your grandmother's soul. I said, Father, I don't know this prayer, but doesn't matter because grandma you didn't hear me but she died 10 years ago he said I heard you and I said but I can't do anything now she's either in hell I hope not or heaven I hope but maybe my prayers could get her out of a little purgatory time and he said, no, go home and pray the chaplet for your grandmother's soul. And I said, Father, she died 10 years ago. She's been judged. You're a priest. You should know this. And, and he said, no. Go home tonight and pray the chaplet of divine mercy for your grandmother's soul. You can help her. I said, well, if she's in hell, I can't get her out. He said, that's true. But you can help her before that. I said, huh? He said, you can help her with your prayers tonight at the moment of her judgment. I said, but Father, she died 10 years ago. He said, God is outside of time. For God, there is no past, and for God, there is no future. It sounds weird. Time was created for us. Time was created for us. But God doesn't have time. Everything is present at one moment for God. If this is Adam and Eve, the beginning of the world, and this is the end of the world, everything, the millions of years in between, God sees it all at once. So I said, huh? He said, listen, God knew in 1993, when your grandmother died, that you would be here tonight and you would pray the chaplet of divine mercy for your grandmother's soul. And he will apply those graces 
back to your grandma at the moment of her judgment because you made the prayer tonight. I said, whoa, Father, that's crazy. I can't get her out of hell. He says, I'm not saying you're getting her out of hell. You're helping because God is outside of time. Your prayers, and this everybody works for anybody, not just suicide. You've lost your parents. You can do this, same thing. You lost your aunt or your uncle or your grandma or your grandpa. You can do this same thing. So he said, pray for her tonight, this powerful prayer called the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I never heard of it. And he said, look, Padre Pio, you all know Padre Pio, was once at his doctor's, and the doctor noticed he was praying. And the doctor said, what are you praying for? And Padre Pio said, the conversion and happy death of my grandfather. And the doctor looked at Padre Pio, he said, I knew your grandfather. He died 20 years ago. And Padre Pio said, I know, but God knew 20 years ago that I would be making this prayer now and he'll apply those graces to my grandfather at his death. Not after he's in hell, at his judgment. And those graces will help your loved ones to say yes to God when maybe they would not have said so. This priest said it's like a squadron of dive bombers coming from 2003 when I was in front of the Blessed Sacrament and going back to 1993 and pouring those graces over my grandmother's head at the moment she died. I said, well, Father, she's in hell because she can't repent. I said, she, she pulled the trigger. She was dead instantly. This is why the church always taught suicide is hell. Because she pulled the trigger, she died in so that there was no chance to repent. And he said, wait a minute. The time it took that bullet to travel three inches, God could create a universe. One second to God is like a thousand years. One millisecond to God is like a million years. So the fact that Grandma pulled the trigger. There is hope that she can still repent. And he said to me, have you realized why is suicide a lost soul? I said, because it's a mortal sin. He said, do you remember what the conditions are for a mortal sin? One, it must have grave matter. Yes, suicide is grave matter. Two, you must have knowledge that it is a sin. My grandma knew suicide was a sin. But three, you must have complete free will. You must want to do it. My grandma didn't want to do it. And so this priest said, listen, your grandma probably didn't have free will. You need to pray for her. So he said to me, go to the catechism, 2282, grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, that's my grandma, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. Then he went on to tell me the next catechism. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives by ways known to him alone. God can provide the opportunity for repentance. Now, does this mean, okay, now that's great, Father. Thank you. That means now I can go take my life? No, because that means you want to do it, and all of a sudden now you violate this and you will be in hell. But for those who were suffering so much like my grandma, 
They have a chance to repent. Why? Because before that bullet traveled three inches, Jesus can come to my soul, my mom or my grandma's soul. Paragraph 1486 in the diary of St. Faustina says, I come to every soul three times at the moment of death and offer them the opportunity to repent. I'm sitting there going, what? And this priest tells me, yes, this is God's mercy. This is God's mercy. It's greater than any sin. And he says, paragraph 1698 of the diary says, it looks like at the end of many lives that there's no repentance. My grandma didn't look like she repented, but Jesus said it isn't so. In the last moment, I come to that soul and offer them my mercy. And if they say yes, they can receive it. The problem is, here's a big problem. Here's a big problem. Was your grandma going to church? I said, no. He said, was your grandma receiving the sacraments? I said, I don't know. He said, did she have last rites? I said, I don't know. Anointing of the sick? I don't know. He said, then she's going to need your prayer. And he told me to pray this prayer, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, because he said, when your grandma meets Jesus, she's not going to recognize him when he comes. Because she has a blinder over her called sin. And when Jesus comes, she's not going to recognize him. I said, gee, thanks, Father. Now I've lost all hope again. And he said, no. When you pray that chaplet tonight, even though it was 10 years ago, grace will be poured over your grandmother at the moment of her judgment. And the grace will help lift the veil over her eyes so that she will see Jesus for who he is. And maybe, just maybe, say yes to him. When ordinarily... She would have said no. Why? This is the power of your prayer. Jesus told St. Faustina, your prayers are that important. The salvation of thousands of souls depends on your prayer. And I'm telling you right now, everybody, how many of you know somebody who has died for any reason? Car accident, cancer, COVID. Their salvation may depend on your prayers. Yes, God saves them. You don't save them. But God is justice, just like he is mercy. If they reject him, then his justice has to let them be lost. But one way you can appease his justice is your prayers. Those meet his justice, and then by his mercy, he can spare your loved one. This is amazing. This is incredible. So I'm there and he says, go home and pray this chaplet of divine mercy. And he hands me a prayer card of the image of divine mercy. And on the back it says how to pray the chaplet. And I took that home and guess what? I prayed that chaplet and I felt something happen. And on the back of that card, was how to pray the chaplet. And I said, Father, I don't know, but I've got to spend the rest of my life dedicated to this message of divine mercy. Now, I had no idea he was going to make me a priest. And I had no idea about divine mercy, St. Faustina. And he gave me that card. And you know, I still have that card. And you know what it says on the back? Printed at the Association of Marian Helpers in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Guess who now is the director of the Association of Marian Helpers in Stockbridge, Massachusetts? But now, when I prayed that chaplet, I felt something. I felt something happen to my grandma. 
I felt a peace come over me that she was now finally okay. Because maybe she would have said no to God, but with that prayer going back, because God is outside of time, God knew in 1993 when my grandma took her life that I would make that prayer in 2003. He took that prayer, gave the grace back to her. It was enough to appease his justice, and therefore he could have mercy on her, and he did have mercy on her, and I believe she is in heaven. Now, I want to finish, because I only got 15 minutes left. I want to finish with what happened after that. So, my life did change. I started going to prayers. This, this moment of adoration affected me. I started going to mass, as I said. I started going to, to, um, to uh, Bible study. And all of a sudden, I felt the calling, the Lord was calling me to the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception to spread divine mercy. This is where God was calling me. But don't let the devil get in. He got in with me. So I came to the Marians and I was engaged to be married. And I was engaged to be married. And I broke off the engagement. They never tell you to keep dating as you are discerning, and I did. That was my biggest mistake. I was discerning a calling to the priesthood, and I didn't want to stop dating Gina because I said, you know, Lord, you understand. I got to keep dating Gina. Because if I discern the priesthood and you're not calling me to the priesthood and I let Gina go, she'll be gone. She was so pretty, so smart, she'd be gone in a day. So God, you understand. So we continued to date. And then when I made the decision to come to the Miriam Fathers, I ended it like an idiot. I'll never forget her face on her patio. As I'm looking at her in my rearview mirror driving away, tears sobbing down her eyes. I made a huge mistake. I should have never done that to her. But I made a bigger mistake to myself because I wasn't ready for religious life. I came to the Marians. I did my first year as a postulant. I did my second year as a novice. I did my third year in first vows and still couldn't put her out of my mind. I still kept thinking about her. You can't become a priest when somebody still has half of your heart. God had one half, Gina had the other. It was torture. One day I would wake up convinced I was to be a priest. The next day I would wake up convinced I was to be married to Gina. We weren't talking, so I assumed it was God's sign I'd become a priest, but then one day I got an email uh oh. It was from a friend that said, I saw Gina and she was asking about you. She misses you. That was the dagger. That was it for me. I started to tell my superior everything and I started to struggle. Every day, do I stay, do I go? Do I stay, do I go? So I reached out to Gina, we started to talk, and she's begging me to come home. She had been waiting for me for three years. She had dates, but she said no. Please come home. So I asked permission to go to Washington, D.C., 
the national, the Basilica, the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And I asked to spend the whole day in prayer. So I prayed the whole day before the Blessed Sacrament. I had to make a decision because renewal of vows was coming up. And I couldn't renew my vows and still have her on my mind, or I couldn't have her on my mind and renew my vows. I had to do something. So I prayed for eight hours. It was the most agonizing eight hours of my whole life. And I could not get an answer from God. Do you ever have that happen? Frustrating, isn't it? I could not get an answer from God. God, just show me. For goodness sake, you sent dreams and angels to Joseph. Can't you even send me something? And all of a sudden, I saw a quarter on the floor. An American quarter dollar. And I got this idea. God, I don't know your will any other way. I'm going to flip a coin. I, I would never recommend doing this. But I was desperate. I said, God, I've been waiting for you to talk to me. I will do whatever you want, but I don't know your will. I have no other way. You've got to speak to me through this coin. Heads... North Carolina tails the priesthood. You've got to show me, Lord. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I'm dying inside. And finally, I flipped that coin up in the air. I caught it and I put it on my arm and I held it for another hour. I couldn't look at it. I said, Lord, you got to tell me. You got to tell me what this quarter, through this quarter, am I to be a priest or am I to marry Gina? And so I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Heads, Carolina, tails, the priesthood. And I lifted my hand, and guess what it said? Heads, North Carolina. <laughs> and I did. I went home, told my superior, I'm not renewing vows. I've determined I'm being married. I had to get a car. I drove down to North Carolina. Gina's talking to me on the phone. Couldn't believe it. This is it. God finally spoke to me. I pulled into that driveway of her house at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, we never lived together. And I was not going to move in, but... I had to go see her, two o'clock in the morning, she comes running out, jumps into my arms, I'm hugging her, it's like I'd never been gone, giving her a hug, it just was everything to me. And we started back our relationship and it was better than ever. It was like I never left, we didn't miss a beat, we went to movies, we, we, we prayed together. We did everything together. We went to church together. We went to our family's houses. It was the best thing a man could ever ask for. I was hired back at my old business that I sold. I was hired back to consult and do help run the business that I created. I had cars. I had house on the lake. I had boats. And I'm engaged to the prettiest girl in North Carolina. Thank you, Lord. Now you got to be thinking, Father, what the heck happened? <laughs> so nine months later, I'm in adoration. I never gave that up. Never gave that up, even though I left the Marian fathers. And I'm in adoration, the same place, praying in the same location, and all of a sudden I hear very clearly, you're to be a priest. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's time to go back to the Marian fathers. I've arranged it all. What? 
I heard it very clear. And you know what I said? No way. God, you would never do this to me. You would never do this to Gina. You would never allow me to break her heart a second time. I destroyed her heart the first time. I've now rebuilt it. You would never ask me to do that to her again. I'm mad at God. And I said, you would never ask me to do that again, ever. It is time to go back to the Marian fathers. No. And I justified it, not that I was saying no to God, but because I must be misunderstanding. Because there's no way that God would ask me to do this and hurt her again. And it was nine months after I had been home. No. So I pushed it out of my mind, but I wasn't at peace. This kept gnawing at my conscience. So one day I'm at work, my old business, and the phone rings. This is three months later now. One year since I've been home. <clears throat> three months earlier, I had this conversation with God in the chapel. Three months later, I'm sitting at work and the phone rings. And I answer it and it's Gina and she's crying. I'm like, is something wrong? That's the first thing you think. She says, we have, we got, I gotta see you. I'm like, are you okay? She's like, yes, I'm okay. So I went flying home and I walked into her house and she comes around out of the kitchen and she says, we gotta talk. now." I thought that she was upset because she could sense in me over the last three months I was not at peace and that she was scared I was going to leave her again. And so I could understand it. Driving over, I said, that's it. I'm not even going to let her talk. I'm going to tell her, don't worry, I'm not leaving you. So when she comes around the corner crying, I had it all planned. I wanted to say, Gina, don't say anything. Don't worry. I'm not leaving you. I know you think I've been acting weird for three months. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to hurt you. I couldn't get those words out. As soon as she came around the corner, I went to speak. She put her hand over my mouth and she said, wait, three months ago, I was praying and God made it very clear you are to be a priest. Now I knew she wasn't making it up because she repeated the same words God gave me. She says it's time to go back to the Marian fathers. He's arranged everything. I'm like, what? She's crying, but she has a smile on her face. She says, God made it very clear. You are to be a priest. And I have to let you be a priest. I was like, what? And when she used those words, I knew it was true. She wasn't making it up. And I sat there and I held her in my arms. And, 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 and this, this, this is the last time. This is Gina. <laughs> Not going to look. <laughs> That's the last I saw her. I know God can take better care of her than I can. I am not the one to take care of her. God will take care of her. I left. I've never looked back. I know God has me as a priest now for a purpose. But I'm going to finish, and I think i got five minutes left. 
I do. I got five minutes exactly to say it. Still don't let the devil get to you. Still. Oops, sorry. Don't let the devil get to you. Now, here's what happened, and this is where I want to finish. I still let my guard down. Fast forward, I come to the Marians. Now I'm dedicated to my priesthood. I get through seminary. I'm so pumped up. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready to fight the good fight. And yet the devil will get in. So I started going around the country talking about this story of my grandma's suicide. Not about Gina, but about my grandma's suicide. And how the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I believe in God's Divine Mercy, saved her from hell. And all of a sudden, I go to this church in Silver Spring, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., and I'm ready to give this talk on the last night about my grandma. And something gets into me and says, you don't know this is true. You don't know your grandma was saved. Your grandma's in hell. And I, and I fell for it, and I'm like, well, then I shouldn't be teaching people this. And so I got this overwhelming feeling that my grandma was in hell and that everything I had learned in that story was untrue. And so I got really bothered by this and I'm due to start speaking in a half an hour and I made, I, I talked to God like this. You got to talk to God like he's a friend. Even if you don't verbally hear his words, you will hear it in your heart. And I said to God, God, if you want me to do this talk, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to give me a sign. Now, I'm not trying to be difficult. Lord knows your heart. If you're just trying to play games with them, like, you know what? Um, make the cow jump over the moon, and then I'll believe you're God. No, you don't play games with them. And I said, Lord, I'm struggling. If you really want me to tell this story, you're going to have to give me a sign. Literally 15 minutes later, I'm packing my bags, I'm walking out to the parish to give the talk, and I'm walking through the parking lot. And all of a sudden, this girl is getting out of her car, and she's got her books stacked up in the car. And she says, are you Father Chris Alar?" And I said, yes. And she says, are you the priest that has this DVD? And she pulls it out of her pocket. She goes, has this DVD about your grandma's suicide? I said, yes. That's, that's me. And she says, Father, I got to speak to you. I said, well, I sure, but can we do it after the talk? Because I'm due up in 15 minutes and I got to get the projector ready. She says, Father, I got to talk to you. I said, okay. And she says, Father, listen to me. I too, like you, had a loved one that, that died by suicide, my uncle John. And I too, like you, didn't pray for him after he died. And I too, like you, hearing your story, I started praying the chaplet of divine mercy. And she said, and Father, you're not going to believe what happened. Like you, are you going to talk about it tonight? And I said, no, I don't think so. And she says, why? I said, because now I'm doubting it. Honestly, I don't even know who you are and I shouldn't be telling you this. But now I'm doubting my own story. She says, Father, you didn't let me finish my story. I went to a priest at the Franciscans who's well known in the Washington DC area who can read souls. I didn't know that at the time. And I went to this priest and I confessed my sins. And I never mentioned anything that we're talking about right now. And I get up to end the confession. And this priest says to me, by the way, she said she finished her confession. She's getting up. And the priest said, by the way, your chaplets worked. And she said, excuse me, Father. And he said, your chaplets worked. And I said, what do you mean? She's talking about herself. And he says, you had an uncle who died by suicide, right? 
She said, what? He said, yes, you had an uncle who died by suicide. She said, father, how did you know that? I've never been to you for confession, and I never said that in this confession. He said, be at peace. Your uncle is in heaven. And I said, Father, how do you know this? And he said, because I just saw it. She said, oh my. And Father Alar, I knew I had to tell you this story. Your story is true. God's mercy is that great. Don't doubt it. I'm sitting there freaking out in the parking lot. And I said, oh my gosh. God, this is the sign. It's true. Ever since then, I've never doubted. God's mercy is greater than any sin. Even suicide. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you all. And you know what? You can get a copy. This story changed my life. I actually wrote about it in the book. Uh, do we have these books here? I'm not sure. Do we have these books here? They're in the back? Okay. So we have the books Please get a copy. It applies not just to suicide, but any kind of suffering or loss. If you have lost a loved one, this is the book that will help you. Any kind of death, tragic, car accident, suicide, or cancer, this book will help you. It'll show you the power of the mass, the power of prayer. And so thank you, everybody. Stay with us, because next we're going to be talking about the demonic warfare and how you fight them with Jesus and Mary. We will now have a 10 minute break. We will now have a 10 minute break. You are watching ATVN Philippines. Emmanuel, the God with us.